colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to make a major transition in this uh, uh, session uh, to perhaps what is the main um, uh, agenda of today, and it is uh, the presentation of the Tandika um, Kandawiri Memorial Lecture, uh, which today uh, focuses on the topic um, um, uh, can Africa run industrialization and development in Africa? Uh, this lecture is uh, being delivered by Professor Fiona Tragena. Uh, uh, I have been involved uh, and copied into a range of communications around uh, as we prepared for this particular lecture. Uh, Professor Fiona Tragena is, holds uh, the South African Research Chair uh, in industrial development uh, around which she has also organized uh, a center that is involved in uh, training uh, in research and uh, public engagement. Um, the chair is, uh, 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 is, uh, is a powerful uh, intervention in itself uh, in the work that speaks directly to the work of Tandikam Kandawiri. She is a, a professor uh, of economics, uh, currently at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and her research focuses on issues of uh, um, structural change, uh, industrialization and deindustrialization, and innovation and technological uh, um, upgrade. Uh, professor uh, Togena has published widely in leading journals, uh, received numerous awards and grants uh, for her research and led large uh, research projects. She's also co-edited uh, several books and serves uh, on a range of editorial boards of various uh, international journals, uh, including uh, uh, also serving uh, on a range as, a, as editorial advisor on a range of book series. Uh, she's been obviously uh, engaged on many panels, boards and councils, and perhaps for this particular lecture, it's important to highlight uh, the fact that uh, uh, she also sits on an advisory panel, panel for the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, an advisory council that advises uh, on a trade and industrial development across Africa. And also most importantly, she is a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council uh, on economic policy uh, uh, in South Africa, advising uh, the president of South Africa, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, she has advised uh, international organizations, including uh, UNCTAD and the United Nations University and the, the International Labor Organization uh, clearly has contributed immensely uh, to a number of uh, important uh, uh, United Nations reports. And therefore, uh, I was, she is somebody who indeed has made a mark in uh, supporting important uh, international, regional, continental uh, policy uh, frameworks. Uh, Professor Fiona is going to speak today again on the topic, can Africa run uh, industrialization and development in Africa? And I take note that the uh, question, can Africa run is a play on one of Tandika's uh, key lectures uh, where Tandika was talking about um, um, running while others walk. Uh, Professor Fiona, please welcome and thank you for agreeing to give uh, this memorial lecture. Um, thank you, Dr. Godwin Murunga and uh, Director of Program, Professor Jimmy Adeshina. It's a singular honor for me to have been invited to deliver the second Tandikam Kandawere Memorial Lecture. And I'd like to recognize the organizers and hosts, um, Kudesria, UNORSID, and the South African Research Chair in Social Policy based at UNISA, um, and in particular, Professor Jimmy Adeshina, uh, for this initiative and for this invitation and also to pass my respects to the family members present. 
I greet everybody here, including the other speakers and panelists, and let me just use that uh, South African shortcut to say all protocol observed. Today's lecture follows the superb inaugural lecture delivered last year by Professor Fontucheru. I'm really humbled to be speaking at an event in memory of such a towering figure as Professor Tandika Mkandawere. Although some of my own uh, gray hairs may suggest otherwise, um, of course, from a different intellectual generation from Tandika and his contemporaries, uh, some of whom are, are here and part of this event, um, who worked closely with Tandika and maintained uh, lasting personal friendships with him. In referring to him here after simply as uh, Tandika, those who know him will understand uh, that no disrespect is intended. In fact, the, the fact that people generally refer to him by his first name is indicative of the, the informality and the affection of his personal relations. In preparing for this lecture, I would turn to a close reading or rereading of uh, Tandika's writings, especially those on industrialization and uh, related issues, which for me was an absolute pleasure and learning experience. And I was really struck by the powerful relevance of his thinking um, to contemporary debates. Some of Tandika's seminal contributions on industrial development and policy um, were written as far back as the 1980s, um, yet four decades later remain highly relevant. For instance, uh, his insights on regional integration are germane to current developments with the AFCFTA. Uh, the issues which he discussed around the financing of industry are very pertinent today. His emphasis on capabilities and technological upgrading resonates with current thinking on technological progress and innovation policy. And the links that he drew between social and industrial policy have a direct bearing on contemporary policy debates, including right here in South Africa, as do his fundamental contributions on the central issue of the developmental state. And I'll be exploring some of these issues further in the course of the lecture. On a bit of a personal note, um, going back to Tandika's writings and preparing for this lecture was actually a beautiful opportunity for me to, in a way, uh, reground and to re-engage with some of the big questions of development in Africa. I think sometimes it's, it's uh, maybe too easy for us to get uh, immersed in our, our current empirical research projects, uh, for example, looking at uh, econometric analyses across African firms and so on. And of course, uh, through these, uh, one hopes to engage with and, and contribute to these overarching questions. Um, and one always endeavors to, as it were, to keep sight of the wood uh, while looking at the trees in close detail. But for me personally, it's really been valuable to take a step back to my political economy roots and to reflect on some of these larger questions um, in preparing and as I'll be doing uh, in, in the course of the lecture. In framing today's lecture about Africa collectively, it's of course important to recognize the immense diversity within the continent, including when it comes to, to industrialization. And I'll reflect on this in the, in the course of the lecture um, and would just borrow Tandika's words as to why he was referring in aggregate to Africa, quote, I will therefore beg your indulgence to accept that I take the diversity of the continent seriously and to accept also that Africa has a real and tangible social existence that validates it as an area of social study, close quote. As was mentioned in the, the opening of, of uh, this event, industrialization was one of Tandika's central interests alongside with and intertwined with his thinking um, on developmental states, national development, social policy, and his broader approach to political economy and development in Africa. He focused on industrial development and policy, especially in the earlier stages of his work, um, but maintained an interest and continued to engage with and to write about these issues um, throughout his career. I've titled today's lecture, Can Africa Run? Industrialization and Development in Africa. Um, as uh, Professor Murunga rightly pointed out, um, this picks up uh, on and actually pays tribute uh, to, uh, to Tandika's own words in his uh, inaugural lecture for his position as chair at the LSE. And uh, that lecture was subsequently published in the Codesio Journal, African Development in 2011, under the title, Running While Others Walk, Knowledge and the Challenge of Africa's Development. Tandika himself, of course, adapted uh, this concept of uh, running while others work, walk um, from Nyerere's famous declaration that uh, we must run while others walk, through which uh, Nyerere was pointing to the need for Africa to move faster, just simply to catch up with the rest of the world. So drawing on the urgings of Nyerere via Tandika, we ask today, can Africa run? 
there's no doubt that we need to do so. Indeed, the whole world is now running uh, with technology advancing at an unprecedented pace. Can we here on the continent accelerate industrialization and technological progress and catch up to sustained high growth and development such that an African child born today can live a long, healthy and fulfilled life with the capabilities to learn, contribute, flourish and make meaningful life choices? The reality is that uh, since Nyerere's exhortations in the 1960s about the need for Africa to run, Africa has not caught up, nor even kept up. African countries have been overtaken by Asian countries that were previously poorer, and we also haven't meaningfully narrowed the gap with advanced economies. For example, China was poorer per capita than almost all African countries in the mid to late 1970s, yet now has sped ahead and overtaken and is, is richer per capita than all African countries today, except for the, the Seychelles. Similarly, South Korea previously had levels of income per capita lower than many African countries, but is now a high income economy. The weaknesses of development in Africa, of course, have got multiple explanations, internal and external, historical and more recent, uh, that are beyond the scope of this lecture. I'll be focusing today specifically on industrialization and development, taking an ontological and a long durée approach. Tandika presented figures showing what he characterized as the abnormally low levels of industrialization in African countries at independence. And while there have been some successes, some African countries are actually less industrialized today than his figures show them to have been at independence. In this lecture, I'll start by discussing uh, Tandika's uh, ideas and then present my own views on some of the causes and consequences of Africa's overall uh, weak industrialization. And I'll then be putting forward a vision for transformative industrialization in Africa. So I'll begin by reflecting on Tandika's thinking on industrialization in the context of, of his broad ideas. He consistently emphasized the centrality of structural change and industrialization for Africa's catching up and for broader development. I'd characterize his thinking as falling broadly within a structuralist uh, tradition. He, works, he drew explicitly on the Latin American structuralists, especially Prebisch, um, and also on Hirschman, as well as being influenced by Gershenkron. During Tandika's studies in the US and in Sweden in the 1960s, um, and while he was further developing his thinking the, in the 1970s and 80s, Structuralism was very prominent in the theory and practice of development, uh, most strongly, but not only in Latin in America, and was especially influential around the centrality of industrialization and structural change uh, for catching up. He was alive to and engaged with uh, these international debates around structural change and located the structuralist approach within the specific context of African countries, considering in particular colonial history, um, and the levels of underdevelopment, um, even relative to the other two major developing regions of the world, uh, Latin America and Asia. And in particular, he considered industrialization and growth in Africa through the lens um, of uh, African countries being what he called the quint quintessential late, late comers to the process of industrialization. In fact, he sometimes referred to African countries as the late, late, late industrializers. Tandika's focus on the centrality of structural change um, can be seen in his view that, quote, the litmus test for any policy is whether it contributes to economic growth and structural change, close quote. Technological upgrading was central to Tandika's conception of late industrialization and catching up, and he highlighted how countries risk being locked in a permanent slow growth trajectory if they stuck to, com to static comparative advantage and fail to advance technologically. He explicitly rejected a linear model of development and technological progress. So that's a teleological view in which technologies are progressively abandoned in advanced economies and then subsequently adopted in developing countries. Instead, and uh, drawing strongly on Gershenkron's concept of late industrialization, he argued that, quote, one of the advantages of late industrialization is access to experiences and knowledge accumulated by the forerunners. Latecomers can telescope development thus adopting certain measures at much earlier stages of their development than the pioneers, close quote. And in a similar vein, he emphasized the importance of learning and productivity for catching up. Tandika was always clear on affirming the primacy of development, and this is cogently captured in his declaration that, quote, Africans do not live by bread alone. This said, bread matters. Thus, while emphasizing the importance of the character of growth and including its distributional character, he wholly rejected any notions um, that growth doesn't matter. 
Um, in my text, I have some uh, extended uh, quotations from his, his writings, which I think I will I will pass over in the in the verbal presentation of the lecture. His views around the importance of industrialization for Africa and the direct causal links between industrialization and catching up were strengthened by the astounding success of East Asian industrialization and growth. For some people today, uh, this might be a matter of economic history, but Tandika lived through this and could directly observe the transformation of, Afri of uh, East Asian economies and, and societies. And these successes in East Asia um, stood in stark contrast with some of the failures of industrialization and, and growth in many African countries over the same period, especially when set back by the structural adjustment programs. So he could see how East Asian uh, countries that had been poorer than most African economies overtook their African counterparts and uh, sped up to their advanced economies. And for Tandika, I think this empirical experience uh, reinforced his structures inspired views about the importance of industrialization for Africa. From the East Asian experience, um, Tandika drew lessons about the importance of a, a dynamic rather than static notion of comparative advantage. And he looked in particular to the active industrial policies that these countries implemented in order to develop future comparative advantages in industries in which they were not yet competitive. And he pointedly uh, contrasts this with IMF advice based on concepts of static, static allocative efficiency. Where Tandika departed from the East Asian experience, including in terms of its lessons for African countries, was in his own unshakable insistence on democracy. He argued forcefully that democracy and development are compatible and that countries need not choose between them. Specifically, he argued that countries can industrialize and grow with democratic rather than authoritarian states. And in this, he drew explicitly on the characteristics that he admired in the Nordic countries and how they had successfully developed with and through democracy. Tandika traced the historical phases of industrialization and deindustrialization in Africa and the determinants of these changes. And he argued that uh, for different reasons at, at different times, including colonialism and the structural adjustment programs, African countries were often out of sync with the rest of the world in industrialization. Going back to the phase of industrialization in, in uh, many other parts of uh, developing regions between 1914 and 1945, he points out that Africa largely lost out on this uh, due to colonialism. So whereas other developing countries were able to pursue import substituting industrialization during this time, uh, which they financed either through borrowing or through debt defaults, um, African countries, which were under the colonial yoke, couldn't protect their own domestic markets as a basis for industrialization, nor could they even run deficits to finance industrialization. So with the exceptions of the special cases of uh, South Africa and the then Rhodesia during this time, he contrasts the experience of colonialism with the experiences of Latin America and even India, whose industrialization during the same period, that's up to 1945, was to lay the basis for their own uh, post-World War II industrialization. And it shows that as a result, at independence, African countries were among the least industrialized countries in the world. Observing that the subsequent phase of uh, ISI in, in Africa post-independence was short, less than a decade in most countries, and actually very different substantively from that in Latin America, Tandika rejected narratives blaming ISI for Africa's uh, economic problems. And he really um, exposed the bankruptcy of characterizations of neo-patrimonialism as just lazy explanations for the poor development outcomes in Africa. The 1980 Lagos uh, Plan of Action emphasized the importance of industrialization, seeing, as this, seeing this essential to Africa's development and to self-sufficiency. But the plan was effectively superseded by the Berg Report and the Structural Adjustment Programs, I'll refer to here after as, as the SAPs, and its recommendations were largely not implemented. Tandika's strong views about the centrality of structural change and industrialization for Africa led to his serious concerns about the deindustrialization that he observed in many African countries uh, from the early 1980s following the SAPs. And he was perhaps a, uh, the first or amongst the first uh, analysts of deindustrialization in Africa. He pointed out that a number of African countries had actually been on positive uh, growth and development tracks prior to the SAPs and had made progress in, in industrialization, growth, and in development. And he directly identifies uh, deindustrialization in Africa in the 1980s as part of uh, what he termed the maladjustment caused by the SAPs. At the same time, he's also recognizing underlying domestic political economy factors that enable this reversal, which I'll discuss uh, further shortly. So he showed how um, African countries' uh, economies were devastated and had their development pathways uh, derailed by the SAPs. 
for Tandika, this wasn't just something to be uh, written about in academic papers, but something that he felt uh, deeply and viscerally as a wound inflicted on the continent. In addition to SEPs, he identifies two primary sources of the failures of industrialization in Africa from the 1980s. Firstly, external shocks, uh, in particular deteriorating terms of trade and heavy external debts, leading to foreign exchange constraints on the import of intermediate inputs uh, needed for industrialization. And secondly, uh, weak institutions and weak industrial capabilities that hampered modernization and competitiveness in industry. Tandeko remarked that, quote, to talk of deindustrialization in a continent that is least industrialized in the world may seem merely faddish, close quote. Yet he argues forcefully that deindustrialization in Africa from the 1980s was not inevitable and that it acted as a break on Africa's growth and development. He warned that, quote, the dismissal of deliberate strategic industrial and trade policies to shape Africa's position in the global trading system runs the distinct danger of leaving Africa on the low productivity, low growth path, close quote. Uh, a warning that uh, unfortunately uh, described what indeed unfolded in uh, some African countries. As with any issues to which he turned his gaze, Tandika looked at issues of industrial development through the lens of critical political economy that was the hallmark of his approach. And this approach can be summed up in his observation that, quote, industrialization and its reversal are quintessentially political, close quote. His analysis of the early failures of industrialization and of deindustrialization in Africa in the early 1980s didn't simplistically attribute these only to the SAPs, and uh, nor did he cast African governments just as the hapless victims of the international financial institutions. Tandika critiqued the class basis of African industrialization, which he seen as, sees in part uh, as resulting from the colonial legacy. Unlike Asia and Latin America, African countries at independence lacked a strong and autonomous indigenous bourgeoisie that could drive the industrialization project. He argues that class and state structures made industrialization in Africa socially rootless, rootless and contrasts this with India and Latin America. He thus argues that, quote, industrialization in Africa was strictly speaking, not a class project. It was essentially a nationalist program and as such lacked the sharpness and purposefulness of a class determined project, close quote. The weak social and class basis and lack of broad based ownership of industrialization were fundamental weaknesses of the industrialization project and made it vulnerable to reversal as indeed happened under the, the SAPs. Uh, in this regard, Tandika observes that, quote, the weak base of the industrialization process is revealed by the fact that outside of labor and a few nationalist groups, deindustrialization has not received much resistance internally. And moving on, um, it would be remiss to reflect on Tandika's uh, perspective on industrialization without bringing in social policy and his novel linking of innovation, industrial policy and social policy. This wasn't done as a uh, forced marriage, um, considering that he had earlier focused on industrialization and then after joining UNOSID, turned his attention more to social policy. Rather, he was able to organically uh, uh, link industrial and social policy in a novel way through an integrated development lens. So he argued that in addition to the direct role of social policy in protecting the vulnerable and improving people's quality of life, social policy played a productive role in the development process. Tandika's uh, conceptualization of social policy can be understood as part of his broader perspective on, on catching up, um, drawing theoretically on structuralism and on Gershenkron in particular, um, and adapted to the African context. He understood social policy as closely linked to the innovation and the technological progress that are needed for late industrializers to catch up. He pointed out that rapid industrialization produces enormous social dislocations and strains, challenging the social acceptance of innovations. So for him, this accentuates the role of social policy in cushioning these dislocations and strains, both to protect those negatively affected and as part of building wide support for innovation and industrialization, despite these uneven distributional effects. A second key role of social policy in this context lies in building the capabilities needed for technological progress, industrialization and growth. Another way in which he linked uh, social and industrial policy was in the financing of industrialization. 
So drawing on the Scandinavian experience, he observed how public pension funds um, as part of social policy were instrumental in the domestic financing of industrialization. Let me turn to Tandika's thinking on trade and industrialization and uh, regional integration. He had strong views on trade orientation um, and, and on the international development debates of the time around import substituting industrialization, ISI, and export oriented uh, industrialization, EOI. And he critiqued what he saw as a, as a false binary between these um, and also as the mischaracterization of the, the East Asian experience um, as, as simply EOI. As I mentioned earlier, he, he emphasized that the period of ISI in, in uh, Africa was actually short, and he rejected uh, neo patrimonialist explanations, both for the adoption of ISI, as well as accounts blaming ISI for Africa's economic problems. He had his own concerns about ISI in Africa, but these were different. And one of these was that uh, the manner in which it was implemented actually undermined uh, regional integration. Um, in addition, he attributes the failures of regional integration to the continued uh, divide and rule tactics of, of the neo-colonial uh, powers um, and, and, and to SEPs. And then internally, he, he lamented what he called the petty nationalism um, generated both by the nature of colonial rule and by the choices made by nationalist movements, which actually led to little progress um, in, in regional cooperation. But he emphasized the integral relationship between regional integration and industrialization in Africa. And he saw regional integration as being of enduring importance uh, for growth and development. Time doesn't permit me to discuss all aspects of uh, Tandika's approach uh, to industrialization. And there's much more that I would have liked to have said about uh, the role of the state, the financing of industrialization, his critique of narrow environmentalism, um, among other issues. I've tried to bring out um, and to engage with his emphasis on the importance of industrialization for Africa's development, his concerns around earlier deindustrialization, um, and in particular, his views on, on trade and regional integration and, and the links with the social policy. Crucially, he considered all of these issues through the lens of critical political economy, never shying away from challenging dominant orthodoxies. Having engaged with Tandika's thinking and contributions on industrialization, I'll now set out my own stall on industrialization in Africa. While explanations for poor growth and development in Africa, of course, need to be multifaceted and country specific, I'd contend that the failures of industrialization are an important part of the story. As discussed, uh, industrialization in Africa has been stop start, and most countries have never reached significant levels of industrialization up until today. In previous writings, I've characterized this phenomenon in, in some African countries as not only premature uh, deindustrialization, but as pre industrial deindustrialization. So this is in the sense of beginning to industrialize before even industrializing in any meaningful sense. Now they can't have, of course, been successes within countries and at particular times, including at present, there are success stories and in particular sectors, but this is an overall uh, long durée appraisal. And it's, it's not only in terms of low manufacturing shares, but the weaknesses of African industrialization are manifest in uh, generally low technology intensity in manufacturing, uh, weak productive capabilities, poor competitiveness and export performance, and manufacturing not strongly pulling along other sectors as an engine of economic growth. Beyond the negative effects on economic growth, uh, deindustrialization is also likely to have negatively affected wider socioeconomic development in Africa, including uh, the, the levels of uh, city, um, and poverty and other developmental outcomes. Even beyond this, I would argue that the failures of industrialization in Africa have had wider social and political economy effects. Industrialization that is deep um, and sustained has profound and irreversible effects on a society. And these kinds of effects are evident, for example, in how the first industrial revolution transformed European economies and societies. These effects, which are not necessarily all positive, reach far beyond matters of productivity and growth. So here we're talking about the transformative effects of industrialization on social and class relations and on a country's broader political economy. Industrialization is class formative. So there's no route to proletarianization and formation of a working class other than through industrializing. And uh, internationally and historically, it's also through industrialization that countries have typically developed a robust uh, middle class. Industrialization also forms the basis for the establishment of a national bourgeoisie as a class that, is, that has the ability to drive a nation's economic progress in ways that, for example, the agrarian uh, land-owning classes could not. 
One dimension of the class uh, formative effects of industrialization is uh, perhaps the subjective one of class identities. Any individual's identity uh, may always be kind of overdetermined in an Althusserian sense. For example, religious, national, ethnic, class, gender, and, and other identities. I would suggest that for the overwhelming majority of, of the poor and uh, the working class in the broadest possible sense in Africa, class identity or class consciousness would not be among the foremost of the identities. In various uh, civil and uh, cross-country conflicts in Africa over time, uh, the young men directly involved as protagonists are often of the same class or socioeconomic status. One wonders uh, whether all of these conflicts would have been as prevalent had the countries become industrialized and prosperous, and if they themselves had regular and unionized factory jobs. Now, this is, of course, not to suggest that uh, industrialization is in itself a recipe for peace. Uh, if anything, the various conflicts between industrialized European countries, including the two world wars of the last century, could readily disabuse us of such a notion. Yet my point is that with weak or incomplete uh, class formation and the associated weaknesses in uh, working class organizations and consciousness, combined with the persistent economic uh, deprivation and perceived lack of economic prospects, under those circumstances, other identities, such as religious or ethnic identities, are likely to become more prominent. Beyond uh, subjective identities and consciousness, industrialized economies are generally less conflict prone than those dependent on uh, natural resources. There's an extensive literature on the links between uh, natural resource dependence, and um, particularly minerals and conflict. And one aspect of this is uh, the high value and portability of minerals, for example, diamonds, relative to most manufactured goods. In terms of electoral uh, politics, um, and, and not shying away from controversy here, um, the electoral platforms that are typically on offer in African countries can generally not be characterized along the same uh, left to right ideological spectrum as in other parts of the world. Of course, economic issues do feature, for example, around uh, food prices and food security, job creation, and so on. But uh, voting in many countries um, tends to more strongly follow uh, regional or ethnic patterns more than socioeconomic status. And I would suggest that incomplete class formation in societies um, that have strongly pre-industrial uh, characteristics and economic deprivation um, mean that uh, traditional notions of class, where we have uh, limited uh, applicability and uh, need to uh, be adapted to these con to these such contexts. Again, just to be clear, I, I do not want to essentialize or romanticize industrialization. It would of course be absurd or, and reductionist um, to attribute uh, the range of, of complex and context specific challenges across Africa to the failures of industrialization, as it would be uh, ridiculous to advocate industrialization as the only silver bullet for Africa's underdevelopment. It's quite well established and it's been discussed uh, over the years how the political economy conditions for and the political constraints on industrialization, or how, how political economy conditions um, affect industrialization. So my argument here is that this relationship is a dialectical one. So the successes and the failures of industrialization also in the other direction partially shape a country's political economy. Or to put it differently, a country's political economy is to some extent endogenous to industrialization. So without being uh, hopefully too crudely materialist or mechanistic, um, I think this is part of the influence of uh, productive relations on social relations. One policy implication of this is that countries cannot uh, just wait for the right political economy conditions um, before implementing industrial development or policy. Of course, we need to recognize that political economy configurations in different countries may be differentially uh, conducive to industrialization but it's also important for countries to just get on with it. Industrialization that's of sufficient scale and duration will itself, at least to some extent, shape political economy conditions. And one aspect of this is that industrialization actually changes the balance of economic power within countries, uh, as well as uh, to some extent internationally. Within a market-based or, or mixed economy, sustaining industrial development requires vesting the industrialization project within a vigorous indigenous national bourgeoisie. And beyond a, a narrow class fraction um, of uh, owners directly of industrial capital, a deep rooting of industrialization also requires that other fractions of capital depend on the continuity and success of industrialization. Uh, so fractions of capital beyond industrial capital, including through intersectoral linkages.
what have sometimes been referred to as uh, vested interests have often been condemned in a manner that I think quite bizarrely uh, suggests that there are any issues or processes in which there are somehow magically no stakes or interests. We do need interests that are deeply vested and invested in the success of the industrialization project. And this is not as uh, merely as rent seeking beneficiaries of state largesse, but as a range of stakeholders prepared to fight, uh, not literally, for industrialization. This is essential to avoiding the stop start patterns of industrialization that have been the experience of many African countries. And here I'm not even referring so much to the early experiences of the structural adjustment, but in more recent years to inconsistent support for industrialization in many countries. If industrial policy is seen as a system of patronage to be doled out as payback for electoral support and then to be reversed by the next administration, industrialization will not go anywhere. For industrialization in Africa to be sustained, it thus needs to be socially rooted. So having a strong class and broader base, including in the state bureaucracy. So this means a depth and breadth of interests across fractions of capital and across classes, as well as across regions of a country and across ethnic groups, interests that are vested in the success and continuation of industrialization. Weak state capacity is one of the arguments that have been voiced in some quarters against an industrial policy agenda in Africa. Uh, curiously, perhaps uh, this argument is usually applied specifically you know, to industrial policy. So we don't hear arguments that no African government shouldn't undertake macroeconomic policy because of weak state capacity. It's, uh, these arguments are made uh, in particular for industrial policy. Um, I would argue instead that state capacity and state capabilities are at least to some extent endogenous to what a state actually does. So a weak and a hands-off state that doesn't undertake active industrial policy simply will not build up the capabilities to do so. And these kinds of capabilities also can't be built up just by sending public servants on training courses. It's through the actual design and implementation of industrial policy that these public sector capabilities are built up. So what we might call learning by doing at the policy level. There will be failures and there will be cases where scarce public resources are not optimally used as has happened in industrial policy all around the world. What matters is learning from these failures and strengthening industrial policy capabilities uh, through practice. To return to the issue of uh, why industrialization for Africa, not only uh, the theory of economic development, but the experiences of development across countries and over time show the importance of industrialization for the development process. We can observe that internationally, there are very few country experiences of sustained fast growth without industrialization. And here I'm not only referring to the successful catching up experiences of developing countries over the past uh, six decades or so, but also going further back to the longer experiences of how the advanced economies of today became wealthy. Manufacturing has certain characteristics that enabled it to play a special role as an engine of growth. I won't have time to go into these in, in, in detail in the lecture, but I think it's also important to recognize that there is a high degree of uh, heterogeneity in each sector of the economy, the diversity of activities, and that some activities within services or agriculture will have these growth pulling properties more strongly than some activities within manufacturing. There's also growing integration between sectors and a fuzziness of sector boundaries. I would thus put forward a, a nuanced view that takes into account both sector specificity and activity specificity and promotes dynamic activities uh, within any sector, while still maintaining that there are common denominators across manufacturing activities um, that are relevant to growth, and hence that industrialization remains key um, to growth and development in Africa as well as more widely. In recent times, uh, there have been debates around whether services can act as an alternative engine of growth in Africa. It's true that services account now for much of employment in Africa, um, that there's great diversity within the services sector, and that there are pockets of services activities um, that are high productivity, high skilled, and, and could be strongly growth pulling. But in aggregate at this stage, I would have no confidence in the viability of the services sector as a whole for driving growth in African economies in the sense of pulling along other sectors and enabling African countries to catch up with more advanced economies. The reasons for this, um, in addition to uh, the inherent characteristics of uh, activities within uh, different sectors, um, one reason is the low levels um, of development in the continent. So without having fully industrialized and still in most countries being at relatively low levels of income per capita, 
It's not feasible to transition on a significant scale economy-wide into the kinds of high productivity, advanced uh, tradable services that could serve as alternative engines of growth. And this is in contrast uh, to the nature and scale and role of services in some of the richest countries of the world that have already undergone long and deep uh, industrialization, even if they've since uh, deindustrialized, through which they've built strong productive capabilities and uh, have complex and diversified economies uh, with dense linkages and learning channels. In contrast, in African countries, notwithstanding some important exceptions, services are largely informal, uh, relatively low skills, low productivity, low technology, and with limited tradability. I sometimes feel that arguments around the potential of services to act as an alternative engine of growth in Africa don't always have a strong uh, scientific basis and sometimes uh, smack rather of attempts to rationalize uh, some of the failures of industrialization in Africa, or perhaps a despondency about the prospects of successful industrialization, or simply a lack of political will to activate uh, the bold measures needed to support industrialization. I'll now move to talk about the importance of regional integration for industrialization in Africa. It's well recognized that domestic markets in many African countries are too small to serve as a springboard for industrialization. It's difficult to achieve the required economies of scale. And this points to the importance of regional integration as a core part of the continent's industrialization pathway. Africa's combined population is about the same as that of China and potentially provides a good basis for Africa's industrialization. The AFCFTA is a fundamental development with the potential to be a game changer for industrial development in Africa. And the broader goals of the AFCFTA explicitly include structural transformation and industrialization, with a vision in which these are integrally intertwined with trade and regional integration. Beyond a, any immediate economic benefits, the AFCFTA can be understood as one part of giving effect to post-independence dreams of united Africa, pan-Africanism and economic independence. And without wanting to overly romanticize the AFCFTA in the spirit, I think it is important for any uh, regional integration project to be animated by a deeper vision that uh, goes beyond economic uh, benefits. As with any processes of regional integration, there will inevitably be uh, winners and losers, at least uh, relatively, based on prior conditions and on policy choices as to how the integration unfolds. And one particular concern here is ensuring that nascent manufacturing sectors in the poorer and least uh, industrialized countries of, of the continent are not thwarted by increased manufacturing imports from the more advanced industrialized economies. This underscores the importance of active steps to build manufacturing productive capabilities in the less advanced economies, including through their productive integration in regional value chains. And another issue here is that um, removing trade barriers is, of course, only part of what is needed to significantly upscale trade within the continent. Among the other issues uh, that need to be addressed are non-tariff barriers, infrastructural deficiencies, and uh, border delays. Um, due to time, I'm going to uh, skip uh, some of the, the areas of industrialization in Africa that I, I uh, would have liked to talk about, uh, specifically technological upgrading and uh, green industrialization, uh, as important as they are. And to come to the final part of, of the lecture um, on what I'm terming transformative industrialization for Africa, or TIFA. As I've argued, um, drawing on theory and on the historical experiences of, international, of industrialization internationally and over time, Deep and sustained industrialization can be transformative, not only economically, but also socially and politically. So this concept of transformative industrialization is broader than that of structural transformation. I identify four dimensions of industrialization being potentially transformative. Firstly, it needs to be disruptive. So disruptive of existing political economies, existing patterns of comparative advantage, production systems, social relations, and so on that are suboptimal for growth and development. Secondly, it needs to be catalytic. So catalytic of wider so uh, social and economic change. And thirdly, this impact needs to be systemic. So going more widely beyond growth and even beyond just the economy. It needs to be long lasting. So not stop start and with long-term transformative effects that could endure even post-industrialization. To make this a little more concrete, uh, the transformative effects of industrialization in the economic domain would include, for example, catalyzing upgrading in other sectors of the economy, contributing to economy-wide productive capabilities, and generating positive feedback loops and cumulative productivity increases. 
And beyond the, the economic domain, the transformative effects of industrialization would include the influence on a country's political economy conditions and social relations, as I discussed earlier. Also, a, a range of wider effects, such as uh, urbanization, modernization, uh, change in gender relations, and so on. So without uh, making the mistake of asking too much of industrialization, it does also need to contribute to societal grand challenges, such as employment creation, poverty reduction, uh, gender equality, and so on. I would suggest that industrialization in Africa needs to meet certain conditions to be transformative. Firstly, scale is important. And here is in including simply uh, the shares of manufacturing and GDP and total employment. So if manufacturing is of insignificant scale in an economy, and there's a lack of depth of industrialization, if it's, uh, for example, less than 5% of a country's economy, it can't have a broader transformative impact. Furthermore, while it'll always be heterogeneity within each, se each sector, on balance, the manufacturing sector needs to have higher productivity, greater complexity, and to be more innovative and technology intensive than the rest of the domestic economy on average in order to play that progressive uh, transformative role. In addition, uh, manufacturing needs to have strong and dense linkages with the rest of the domestic economy, not only to pull along the rest of an economy, but also to have that uh, transformative impact. And here I'm referring not only to forward and backward linkages, but also to technological linkages and spillovers, learning and transfers of knowledge and skills and so on. Let me illustrate a TIFA approach a bit more practically by contrasting it with a narrow industrialization approach on the specific policy of issue of uh, industrial hubs. And by industrial hubs, I'm referring collectively to industrial zones, uh, districts and parks, special economic zones and so on. Industrial hubs have been implemented in, in different forms and with uh, different purposes across Africa and beyond uh, with varying results. So my intention here is not to focus on industrial hubs per se, but to illustrate what is different in a TIFA approach, um, but with references uh, to policy towards industrial hubs. So rather than being comparative advantage conforming or basing production choices on st static comparative advantage, from a TIFA perspective, their production and in industrial hubs needs to be based on dynamic comparative advantage or be comparative advantage defying. So related to this, rather than hubs just being places to produce more of the same of what is already produced in the rest of an economy, a TIFA approach emphasizes the role of hubs in diversification and upgrading from a country's existing production profile. While countries are at different levels of development and cannot all pitch at the global technological frontier, Production and hubs needs to at least push the envelope of a country's own technological frontier. Furthermore, to be transformative, hubs cannot operate as enclaves, but need to be integrated with the domestic economy through multiple linkages and channels. And again, this isn't only forward and backward linkages through supply chains, um, but a wider set of linkages. A policy approach to industrial hubs from a TIFA perspective wouldn't aim to attract firms based just on exemptions, low wages and poor working conditions uh, than in the rest of an economy. But rather the attraction should be based on positive support um, on the benefits of firm agglomeration and on export opportunities from hubs. A TIFA policy approach to hubs doesn't treat them in isolation, but instead hubs policy would be integrated with wider industrial, trade, innovation, environmental and other policies. So this sort of approach is a radical departure from the experience of industrial hubs um, in, in some countries uh, not only in Africa, where in, in, in certain instances, have, uh, for example, in some EPZs uh, have just been a, a glorified sweatshop doing final assembly activities uh, that generate some foreign exchange and create some low wage jobs, but without contributing to upgrading and to deepening a country's uh, industrialization. A TIFA perspective recognizes the potential of hubs to support upgrading, um, to raise the scope for cumulative productivity increases, to build productive capabilities and so on, especially in African countries with only nascent manufacturing sectors. What's crucial for transformative industrialization is that these effects extend firstly into the rest of a domestic economy beyond hubs, and secondly, into other sectors outside of manufacturing. And I think we have seen uh, in, in countries such as Ethiopia, some of the success of industrial hubs. So I've used the example of industrial hubs to illustrate what distinguishes a TIFA approach. And we could extend the same logic to distinguish a TIFA approach to various other industrial policy issues. It's crucial to note that there's no one size fits all. Policy needs to take account of country specificities as well as even subnational uh, specificities. So TIFA will, will mean different things in different country contexts. It's an ambitious agenda 
asking us to look with fresh eyes at the potential of industrialization and to aim at a big push as part of new development pathways uh, for African countries. I'm now going to move to my, my final concluding remarks. In noting that global conditions have changed uh, since the rapid industrialization successes of the four original East Asian Tigers, Tandika opined in 1988 as follows, quote, so obviously whatever industrialization miracles take place, or for what that matter, whatever reversal of the deindustrialization process Africa achieves, it will be under radically different conditions. There can however be no doubt that the current process of deindustrialization, the dismantling of structures that sustain much of the industrialization, the institution of social structures of accumulation that are highly volatile, will once again leave Africa unprepared to capture whatever new opportunities an upturn in the world economy may have. Close quote. These prescient words from Tandika, penned about a third of a century ago under different continental and global conditions, remain relevant regarding the, the problems of African industrialization, um, but to its enduring importance, and in highlighting how underlying economic weaknesses constrain African countries from taking advantage of emerging opportunities. Yet we do have cause to be more optimistic now. The structural adjustment programs uh, that Tandika discussed at length dealt a long lasting blow to African industrialization. Path dependency, feedback loops, and cumulative causation mean that what could have been a virtuous circle of building capabilities, upgrading, and in industrialization and growth instead became a low equilibrium trap. When productive capabilities are broken down through deindustrialization, this can't be easily reversed. And the collective nature of capabilities and of learning by doing mean that this has broader negative effects uh, beyond individual firms. Had Africa been able to maintain pre-structural adjustment rates of industrialization and, 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 or growth, or to follow pathways closer to Asian counterparts, the continent would be very different today. We must own up, however, that very different choices could have been made at least in the more than three decades since the structural adjustment programs. There's a dialectic between factors that are internal and external to a country, and countries do make choices. That in turn, these choices have implications for the balance of forces domestically and internationally, as well as for countries' own policy space. Even within historical and current uh, global constraints, African states do have agency and to be honest, have not been prevented from pursuing active industrial policy over all of these intervening years since the structural adjustment programs. Of course, there's always issues of limited financial resources, capacity constraints, and so on. But it's in countries' domestic political economy that we can actually understand the failure to pursue effective industrial policy in most, not all, but most countries of the continent over the past few decades. Industrial policy has made a comeback in Africa and I think that's even before it's more recent uh, comeback internationally. Industrial development and policy now feature prominently in the visions and the policy documents of, of governments across the continent, as well as regional and continent-wide bodies. There's an ongoing battle of ideas around the scope, the purpose, the instruments of industrial policy, and how this connects with other policy domains, such as macroeconomic and financial policy. Furthermore, implementation and outcomes have been uneven. The industrialization successes of countries such as Ethiopia serve to demonstrate the possibilities of success in the continent, even in low-income countries with limited resources, where there is the political will to industrialize and concrete actions actually implemented to actualize this. Consistent with the changing fortunes of industrial policy in Africa has been changing interest in this field within academic research. So in the 1980s and 1990s, there was actually a, a dearth of research um, on industrial development and policy in the, in, in the continent. And I think that as well as the general struggles of many African universities during this time um, and the reliance on, on donor or consultancy funds for research, as well as the practical weaknesses of industrial development uh, during this period, meant that economic research in the continent was overwhelmingly focused on, on different issues. During this hiatus, Tandika was one of the few to continue impactful research uh, in this field in Africa, along with some others based uh, in or outside of the continent, and I see that uh, some of those are, are, are part of this virtual event today. So we can actually observe a generational gap um, in African researchers uh, specialized in these issues. And for me, it's exciting to see 
the upsurge in interest and in active research in this field across the continent, especially among scholars. For example, a few months back, we held the second uh, Young Scholars Conference on Structural Chain and Industrial Policy in Africa. Um, and in the presentation of, of, of many excellent papers in this field from across the continent. And I see some of the presenters are here in this um, virtual call today. We need ambitious research agendas that connect with the fundamental development questions facing African countries. So in my final words, um, we've seen the rise and the fall and possibly now the rise of industrial policy in Africa. Hopefully the current emphasis on industrial policy will be sustained and there'll be the intentionality and the political will to make daring and sometimes difficult choices and to boldly implement on the kind of scale that can make a difference. Transformative industrialization for Africa could be part of an ambitious pathway contributing towards this. Let's reignite our ambitions of development and reimagine a, an industrialized, prosperous and integrated Africa. Thank you for listening. <laughs>